Welcome to another episode of London Lights. I'm your host, Dan Mailer, and today I have a guest, John Rowlands. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about John before we get rolling here. Uh, John is a legendary rock and roll photographer. He now resides in London, Ontario. He's worked with the Beatles, the Stones, David Bowie, Dave Clark Five, Elvis Presley, Alice Cooper, and the list goes on and on, virtually all of the greats. He's been 60 years in the industry as a photographer. He's taken four and a half million photos in total, and some of his photos have become iconic, like the one behind me here on David Bowie. Uh, his, his photos have appeared in Life Magazine, Rolling Stone Magazine, and many others. John, welcome to the show. Well, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. So, John, not only have you taken photos of the stars, but you've become friends with many of them. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's the way it works. If, if you want to really get to know somebody, you really got to know somebody. So uh, <laughs> you're asking them to, uh, to do something quite candid, but at the same time, uh, personality uh, does cut it pretty good, yeah. Well, you've taken photos, uh, as I say, and become friends with many of these uh, these stars that all of us have dreamed about befriending or spending time with. That doesn't really sound like a job, a job, John. It sounds more like a dream gig. Well, it's uh, it's got me so far uh, thus far, and uh, I haven't worked a day in my life uh, by my <laughs> standards. So all right, I'm happy for that. Now, I know that you grew up in Oshawa, and uh, I went to school, of course, in uh, Ontario as well, high school. I don't remember any courses on rock and roll photography. <laughs> so well, how did I, you get your start in this business? Uh, a camera club uh, for the technical uh, uh, details and uh, the equipment. And then... Uh, uh, I worked at RCA, I had a part-time job shooting a refrigerator, <laughs> and they, they finally said, well, why don't you come and shoot some of our entertainers? And uh, that's when I, I started working for the promotion department at uh, RCA and then Capital and all the other major labels in Canada. So, John, you told me as a young man you were a big fan of Brenda Lee. And uh, you had written some letters to her, and uh, I guess you attended one of her concerts when she came to Ottawa. And you had to get uh, allowance from your father to buy an extra roll of film. Tell me about that. Yeah. Well, I, I was uh, 13 at the time, and uh, she came and played Ottawa thanks to uh, RV Glatt. And the ticket price was $1.50. And... Um, I had a whole roll of film to shoot and flash bulbs. And uh, after the show, I, I uh, wanted to thank her for a great show and uh, went backstage and knocked on the door. And her mother answered and said, why don't you come in and tell her yourself? She's sitting right over there. So and she invited and you in? And, it and somehow it came up that you- Yeah. Somehow it came up that you'd taken some photographs. Well, uh, it's already, she knew I'd taken photographs, and uh, but uh, a chance to chat about school and, and uh, see what it was like to be on the road as a, a young man, and, uh, and certainly uh, through Brenda, understand the schooling and whatnot that went on while she was traveling, uh, really impressed me. So uh, uh, I looked at it all, uh, something to do and uh, sure enough that's where it starts uh, from that point on my life was very different well let, let's talk about Brenda Lee because uh, I'm always uh, just blown away by some of these photos of how people through serendipity get a start in a career and uh, so here you are you're you say 13 years old yeah and uh, you borrow some allowance from your dad to buy some extra film you go into the show, you take the photos, you go knock on Brenda Lee's dressing room door. Mom's there and says, come on in. Now, are they interested in these photos that you've taken? 
Well, they they said at the end of the evening, uh, uh, mail down the negatives and we'll send you some money. So and did that, they? Uh, kind of inspired me. Yeah, I got thirty five dollars for my first job. <laughs> so you were able to pay your dad back in nineteen fifty, and you made yeah. a profit. Yeah. <laughs> well, an ounce of gold was worth thirty two dollars. Oh, wow. Well, that was, sounds like a good start at the age of 13. What happens next? Next was uh, they knew somebody in Nashville that was managing uh, an entertainer who was going to be doing uh, the same uh, radio show, uh, the Campus Club with Coca-Cola. And uh, they uh, let me know that uh, if I showed up and took pictures, this guy, uh, I think his name was Tom, would hand me 50 bucks at the end of the gig. So, so I, I went and uh, photographed the show and, and uh, got the kids in the picture and the disc jockey in the picture and so on and uh, handed the roll of film to Tom, who uh, gave me 50 bucks and I was just elated. And uh, this was my uh, second professional job and uh, the, the subject was Sam Cooke. Oh, the legendary Sam Cook. Right. So now you're now what, 13 or 14 still? And you're getting $50. Yes, sir, 13. Yeah. And that's big money at that time. Yeah, it was huge. It's more than I was I bought, making. I was making a dollar twenty-five at McDonald's an hour. <laughs> $50 sounds pretty good in that from that perspective. So where does it go from there? You've now taken photographs of a couple different shows. Uh, you're making for your age some amazing amount of money. Uh, yeah. so where do you go from there? Uh, from there, it uh, it started going into uh, record labels and, and uh, local personalities. I started working uh, in Ottawa for the Esquires, and uh, uh, I moved to Toronto at the time and uh, started uh, shooting for Paul White at the Capitol. And uh, that got even bigger, uh, shooting uh, recording acts and uh, lots of shows. So it just grew uh, from this uh, tiny seed that was my recreation into uh, quite an event uh, and uh, life-changing occupation. Well, you're, uh, I assume this is in the early 1960s, correct? Right. So you're about to go through what became one of the most explosive decades of pop music. Uh, we know what happened in the 1960s. We still look back to, as a legendary decade of music. And we know all the great bands that came out of that time period. So there you are on the cusp of that, 13, 14, 15 years old. You're starting to make some money. Uh, did you continue with school or did you drop out? What happened? No, I, I stayed in school and uh, used the uh, camera club at Cedar Bray, where I went to school in Scarborough, and uh, used their paper and uh, sold uh, a photograph stuck to the wall in the camera club and uh, uh, augmented uh, uh, my entertainment with these shows. So. For a young guy, uh, 13, 14, it was perfect. I had uh, people coming up to me in the hall and saying, uh, did you uh, work with Dave Clark Five? I said, yes. Did you shake his hand? Well, which hand? Which hand? <laughs> well, we'll talk about Dave Clark Five in a minute. Uh, of course, people may forget that at that time, uh, they were considered as good as the Beatles. They were rivaling the Beatles in popularity. And the girls would go crazy at their concerts. Did you travel across Canada with them, or what happened? I, I just went as far as Sault Ste. Marie with the, all I needed uh, to get uh, representation for capital. Yeah, sounds they like were, a big job. They were interested in uh, crowd shots and and uh, female reaction, and uh, of course uh, the band itself. And could you understand what was happening? I mean, how these Young girls were going crazy for the bands, and uh, of course, the young men are wanting to be in the band. 
Uh, could yeah. you understand the phenomena at your age, or were you caught up in it? Well, yes, uh, no, I, I thought uh, when I first contemplating it, uh, going to Brenda's show, uh, I knew what it was, and uh, knew that it was taking over from uh, things like uh, Ed Sullivan, Elvis Presley, Tommy Dorsey, and all that stuff, and uh, getting banned on TV, and uh, you know, some character in the States was uh, burning records and so on. So I knew the hysteria was uh, starting to happen. Yeah, we haven't seen anything like that in the last few decades, but we'll come back and talk about all that, including this iconic photo of David Bowie that you took. Uh, gr some great stories I know you've got to share and you're gonna tell us about some of the stars you befriended. We just have to take a commercial break. So viewers, hang on, we're just gonna be a couple minutes, we'll be back with legendary rock and roll photographer, John Rollins. All right, we're back now on London Lights with legendary rock and roll photographer, John Rollins. He's sharing some very funny stories and interesting stories with us <laughs> about some of the great stars that he worked with as he took photographs in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. 60 years actually in the business. Okay, John, let's start at the beginning. They say rock and roll started with uh, Elvis Presley. I know there were other acts there, including Conway Twitty that you worked with and uh, Gene Vincent, people like that. Tell us about Elvis. It was a nice personal touch because uh, Ed Preston uh, was going to be meeting with uh, the executives for RCA division, uh, Elvis. And uh, they sent uh, four guys uh, to Toronto and he said he wanted some nice pictures uh, unseen of Elvis on stage. So he sent me to uh, Detroit and I went down and shot the pictures and we put them on the wall behind him at, the, at his office. And uh, these guys came in and said, oh, you got some, uh, nice Elvis stuff. Uh, where'd you get it? And uh, he said he sent his boy down to the shop. So I sent my guy to Detroit to do a session so I could show you some good photography. And uh, that was that. And uh, interestingly enough, I got a call about a week later from New York. And it was one of the guys uh, that was in the meeting and he said to me, uh, how would you like to do that for us and uh, represent RCA and, and take the photographs? We want, to, we want to buy licensing and copyright, so we'll pay you flat fee. So I, I did 48 shows and uh, I, I made uh, some decent money, but uh, I, I didn't get any next at that point. And, uh, it was only uh, after I left, I, I asked Tom that I have uh, no nags to show for my work. And uh, he said, well, uh, let's meet tomorrow and I'll uh, change all that. So uh, he gave me 50 nags back so I would have Elvis represent my archives. And, uh, Very nice. So I assume then things are starting to really cook for you as a photographer. Yeah. Uh, did you get involved with the Beatles? Yes, I, I, I worked with the Beatles in uh, 65 and 66. And uh, I did all their capital uh, press conference stuff. And uh, uh, some of the events that, that involved the public and certainly uh, shot the show. And then uh, I went on to uh, also work with George Harrison on his solo tour in 74. And that was basically because uh, uh, of all the Beatles, I, I, my favorite was George and uh, we got along well. So uh, we were always talking about guitar and uh, that's how that started. So now I even got a couple of uh, impromptu guitar lessons from uh, oh, John wow. and George. Yeah. Oh, I'm so jealous. <laughs> so, um, so you're not just taking photos of these acts on the stage. You're also going uh, 
behind the scenes with them and catching them on their informal moments. And uh, I take it, as you say, there are things that you need to connect with these stars on, and, and this sometimes turns into a relationship. Yep. It's just like you go to show up in an office and you got a guy sitting beside you on another desk. And uh, it was uh, friendly and uh, casual. Uh, no big corporate intent in those days. So uh, uh, no politics to be afraid of. And uh, I, I jumped at it. Yeah. Oh, I would too. But how, how, when you say you have a relationship with somebody like George Harrison, what does that involve? Are you going to lunch with them, to breakfast, dinner? Uh, you going to his well, house? Well, with George and the powerful situation of him being in the most popular band in the world, I could call him at the Cracker Jack Palace. And up until uh, 95, I did. And uh, 95, his uh, secretary told me he's... Uh, gone to uh, Switzerland for uh, chemotherapy. And uh, we, we'll pass along what's going on with George, but you'll probably never speak with him again. So I gave that up uh, for, uh, you know, just being in touch with a wonderful guy and leaving messages, you know. I saw him a couple of times in LA and Long Beach. And uh, so I, I knew it was, he was okay uh, until then. We uh, we also got along on what makes a good shot, and uh, I'm happy for that. So. Now, uh, Londoners uh, hosted a concert with the Rolling Stones. When I say concert, I use that term lightly. Uh, I think they played one song before uh, the police came in and busted things up, or the power was turned off, or something. <laughs> Now, yeah. you, uh, were you involved at all in that concert or any concerts in Canada with the Rolling Stones? Yeah, yeah. I worked with them in, in 65, and uh, that's when that uh, incident took place. And I uh, uh, came to, uh, to London, as a matter of fact, with the Stones and, uh, and sat in the car with Brian Jones. So uh, there was a, a Rolling Stone parade through uh, London at the time. So, and, uh, and my friend Phil and I were both there because uh, we were on the road for Capitol Records and London Records and RCA at the time. So we had a lot going on at that point. And uh, there's always a big debate. John, there's always a big debate about the Stones versus the Beatles. And uh, do you have any comments on that type of rivalry or any comparisons you can well, make? Well, it, it was all uh, made up for the for the fans and uh, made a, an interesting rivalry and uh, but the music of course is very different and uh, more R&B factor in, in stones and, and pop culture with the Beatles so uh, it was uh, it was both at the same time and uh, of course the uh, fan magazines that, that I was working for like 16 magazine uh, used uh, a lot of those pictures Oh, I probably bought a few of those issues. Tell me, yeah. what was, uh, did, what was the, the first time you saw one of your photographs in a major magazine? Tell me about that. I assume that's got to be a great thrill. Well, it, it, it's interesting, like, uh, you know, and, and working with entertainers, uh, I, I've been with many of them when they've heard their record on the radio for the first time. So it would, it would compare to that, but uh, I was obviously excited because it was a, a professional grasp uh, on this industry that I wanted to be part of. So uh, that, that's how I felt uh, accomplished more than, uh, how would you say, entertained by, uh, holy smokes, I just got a picture in the Toronto Star. Well, the peak of the mountain, uh, I think, for probably photojournalists and journalists for rock and roll would be Rolling Stone magazine. Did you have any photos in there? Yeah, over the years, and uh, oddly enough, uh, I did a nice story on Anne Murray for Rolling Stone. So, yeah, I, I, I worked with them. It was also interesting to note that uh, George uh, Harrison told me, he said, John, I'll, I'll pose for a portrait. 
as long as you can guarantee me it'll never get in Rolling Stone magazine. <laughs> he, he didn't get along with Jan Warner, so. I see. Okay, look, I mean, we're running uh, short on time, and I'm a, very aware of that happening, and we've got so much to talk about. Uh, I'm just going to kind of name drop some of the big stars, and I want you to tell me a quick story about them. Freddie Mercury, did you see Bohemian Rhapsody? Yeah, and, and I thought it was uh, made for the public, and uh, the storyline was uh, toned down, and... Uh, and that was about it. And many, many people uh, don't like to see movies manipulate their image uh, of the actual story. And uh, this was the case uh, well shown. Same with the Elton John movie, you know. Oh, I hated that movie. Yeah. It many. just was such a fantasy. Yeah. What can you tell me about both those guys, Elton John and Freddie Mercury? Uh, what were they like? Well, they were see, in the business of, of the record industry. It, it, uh, it's the mechanicals of what's going on and uh, highlighted by parties and, and dinners and whatnot, entertaining the band while they're in town. And with, uh, with uh, Freddie, it was always, uh, let's go to George Bigliardi's. They liked the food already. And... Uh, we knew George, and, and it was a quiet, private place on uh, Church Street. So let's go over there. And uh, what was discussed at, at that table is, is always there for uh, anybody that wants to uh, open up to. So, uh, okay. We're running short of time, him. John. John, yeah. let me get to David Bowie. I know you had a close relationship with him. You also had a relationship with Alice Cooper. You were friends with both of those guys. Uh, let's talk about Bowie. There's the iconic photo here behind me, the archer. And I think you had indicated that was one of Bowie's favorite photographs of himself. That's what I was told. A, a nice piece uh, that I've kept of uh, 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 David in a spotlight. And uh, for John, with respect, David Bowie. And that's uh, uh, a nice uh, compliment to, uh, to my working with an incredible guy who the BBC has determined uh, is entertainer of the year. The year or the decade? The century? Well, century, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he was and, big. Uh, uh, of course, I, where you belong. I, I became a big fan in the Ziggy days. And you knew him uh, after that when he was the Thin White Duke. Yeah. Um, uh, was he, he was an interesting entertainer because he played these incredible uh, different roles and he would subsume himself in those roles. But what was he like in person? Was he able to get out of character or would he stay in character uh, after, the, after he got off the stage? Well, uh, Ziggy was uh, staying in the character and... Uh... Uh, I did uh, Diamond Dogs, and uh, it was a, a good transitional tour because uh, he could work and, and uh, partially be the character and, uh, and come back to being David Bowie when we went out after the show or, or wherever we were going and, uh, and go in between uh, that area of uh, persona and uh, entertainer. John, and then, uh, we, we got to wrap up here in a moment. I'm going to ask you this. You, you've rubbed shoulders with so many of these huge stars. You've lived in uh, numerous different cities. You're now back in London. I understand you have some health issues. You've had a stroke, and we wish you the best of luck with that and good health care. But can you tell me this about the people you've run into? We often put them up on a pedestal, these rock and roll stars. Are they the same as you and I? Did they get up in the morning, put their pants on one leg at That's a time? Right. And yeah, they, they did. And how much they pay attention to the ego is up to everybody individually. And uh, you have the power to do that. And uh, if they can, they'll, they'll take it. And uh, the rest of the time, uh, they, they still uh, eat, sleep, and drink every day. And uh, regular as can be. And, of course, Alice Cooper is considered such a 
wild man on stage, but off stage, he's a pastor's son. He golfs every day, and uh, yeah. you're still friends with him, correct? Yes. And uh, he he, uh, he owns a, a golf course in Scottsdale, has an annual tournament uh, with golfer uh, PGA types and uh, rock celebrity golfers too. All good. He raises money for charity, I understand. Yes. And um, built the uh, Phoenix Youth Center. Right. So that kids, kids can be dancers and bass players and drummers and so on. And uh, you can go there to, uh, to practice your craft. John, we got to wrap up. Uh, okay. I'm sorry the time has gone so quickly. We hardly touch the, uh, the, the, the edifice here. Uh, we just scraped the top of it. Uh, thanks for taking the time to, to share with us today. Best of luck with your health issues. And uh, we look forward to reading some of your books with your photos in it. And uh, your legacy is tremendous. Thanks for being a Londoner. And right. thank you for coming on London Lights. Stay tuned for more episodes of London Lights coming up soon.